Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women's Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Hey, friends. Hey, this is Lisa from Black Women's Stitch and the Stitch Please podcast, and I am honored. And like I say every week, this is a very special episode, but this episode is especially special. Y'all, we have the privilege of speaking with Swiss Haitian Finnish artist, Sasha Huber. She uses her research and activist-based art practice to contend with powerful entanglements of scientific racism, natural sciences, and the histories of photography. Her work is also a work of love, of reclamation, of remembering, of looking at the past and the present and the future simultaneously. I'm going to read a quote from um, an exhibition catalog that's called You Name It that talks about her tailoring freedom exhibition, which we're going to really get into today. And it says, you're lifting rocks from the past to build a bridge to the future. This is the work of Sasha Huber. And we are so delighted to have her today on the Stitch Please podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sasha, and welcome. Thank you so much, Lisa, for the invitation to meet you. I am so excited that you're here. Can you tell us about your sewing story? This is something that we ask guests on the Stitch Please podcast. What is your sewing story? How does sewing um, show up in your life, in your family? Yes, thank you. So interestingly, I grew up with um, a mother who loved sewing a lot and she did really all her clothes, but also mine and my sister's clothes herself. So I have this childhood memory when we went to buy the fabric and they knew my mother by name when we came there. So, and I was like sitting under the tables and looking at all those colorful fabrics and I really, I was, I must have been really small still, but I have this vivid memory of, of joining her to this, to this place. And, uh, and the other thing was in relation to meeting you, I came to think of my great grandmother, my mother's grandmother from Haiti who would make those blankets out of old fabrics, clothing um, that you explained me before are called yoyos. So I was um, given a piece of one big blanket that she made so that we could kind of share it with each other. So my one other aunt, she uh, did this, had this idea to, to do that. And I have um, one of those pieces, which is maybe half a meter long and 20 centimeters wide. So a small piece. Um, yeah, this is something I, I sometimes thought I would like to, I would like to make an artwork that honors her and, and kind of relate links to this, because this is the only physical memory I have from her. And besides the memories I have from meeting her still when I was a child in New York, um, yeah, this is one of the things. There are more more stories to to tell also about my other aunt who was a fashion model, Janie yes. Tomba, who was de- designing dolls called Tombalinis, also made of recycled fabrics. So uh, I don't have one of those, but I, I grew up seeing them from my cousin, her daughter. And, and that was also really special to see how, you know, they, they could find a, a like a way of, being creative and do something on their own with their own hands. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk, tell us a little bit about like where you grew up? You seem to have a very cosmopolitan, like right now, you, where are you right now? This moment you are in Finland. Is that correct? Yes. I'm in Finland um, where I've been living since 20 years, actually. My partner is uh, from here, Petri, and he actually wrote this quote that you wrote. Yes, uh, that oh, is in it's the beautiful. catalog, and he's been there since the day one. So I became, I developed in becoming an artist here in Finland as, yes. a, as a professional artist. Um, but my my father, he's from Switzerland, and my mother is from Haiti. But she, uh, the family, immigrated to New York in the mid '60s because of the dictatorship. Mm-hmm. And then my parents uh, met and moved then 
to Switzerland. And that's how I was born in Switzerland um, after my sister. She's four years old, older. And I have also uh, a half brother from my mother's earlier union who, who grew up in Canada. Um, so I have a brother in Canada and um, aunts in New Jersey and New York. And my cousin lives in upstate New York and yeah, and we have cousins in Texas also as well, but then wow. also family in Haiti, of course, and, and uh, spread around Switzerland mostly. So this is about these three different places. <laughs> it's really quite wonderful that your art practice is able to bring together so many things. Um, it brings together photography, it brings together history, and it brings together all of us as spectators, when we stand to watch looking, when we stand to watch um, Tailoring Freedom, you started that project after your work with the Demounting Agassi campaign. Can you tell us a little bit about what it means to demount Agassi? Or t who was Agassi? Who was this person? <laughs> and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name in the in the Swiss way properly, but um, how? Who is? Um, tell us about Agassi and why it is important to demount him. Yeah, so I got to know about Louis Agassi, who was from Neuchâtel in Switzerland. It's a French-speaking part of Switzerland. Switzerland. Um, already 2006, when I read a book about uh, Swiss involvement in the, um, the slavery and slave trade, which was written by a historian and activist from Switzerland called Hans Fassler. And my sister, she gave me this book that he wrote, which was at the time the third book about this topic, everything we didn't learn at school. Like, you know, Switzerland wasn't a, didn't have a colonies, but they had colonists that were in the Caribbeans and her owning uh, plantations and so yes. on. So Switzerland yes. was involved also with the plant, with yes. the cotton and, and other uh, commodities. So I was very, um, you know, it really mixed me up uh, and it made mm. me contact him, the, the author, and that's how we met originally. And then two years later, as I know, 2007, uh, a year later, he founded this demand in Louis Agassiz's campaign because it was the year when uh, his 200-year birthday was celebrated. And oh. well, he was known as a glaciologist, firstly, and he moved in nine, uh, 1846 to the States. He was invited to lead a lecture series, invited by, by Harvard University, and he ended up staying there yes. and start a new family as well and and so on and that's where he saw black people probably for the first time properly hmm. and mm -hmm. that's how he slowly developed in becoming one of the most influential racists of the 19th century and when yes. his 200 year birthday was celebrated the fact that he for example used or one could say abused the um, at the time, new technology of photography to, photo, um, to commission a photographer to document photographically enslaved people without clothes, which was the very mm -hmm. first time that that happened, and in order to try to prove the inferiority of black people, was yes. not mentioned at the time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it was completely left out. So he is really celebrated and everybody's proud about him and so on. And he felt that it was, would be necessary uh, to kind of broaden up that history writing yes. and rewrite this. And, you know, and that's how the idea came of his to suggest a renaming of one of the many mountains existing around the world called Agassiz Horn to be renamed after Renti, who was, an, was a Congolese-born uh, person who was enslaved that was photographed at the time. Yes. From him, so and he seemed to be the eldest of the that group of seven people that were photographed in this way, including also his daughter Delia. Um, mm -hmm. So the idea would be to rename that mountain in honor of Renti, but also in honor of all the others who experienced yes. similar fates. So and and then he invited me to be part of the committee of this demanding Louis Agassiz campaign and that's when I felt I want to do more than just give my name so it really 
mm. touched me and I felt, um, yeah, I want to do more. And then this is, this is how then my, at the time, new way of work started that I left the studio and I went to that place, to that mountain and renamed it yes. physically with a sign, with a new name and, Yes, this is what we see here, everyone. If you look at the co if you look at the cover of the book, I'm holding it here in the screen, um, published by the Power Plant Autograph and Moose Publishing. It is a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous book overall. But the cover is this bright white snow, and we see Sasha heavily attired in a coat and maybe four other coats at the top of this mountain with the sign that we can see from this distance has Renty's photo or Renty's image on the cover. Tell us about what it meant to be walking with a glacier pick. What were you wearing here, actually? Because mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine how cold it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was August, actually, but up there, it was, of course, uh, there's always uh, snow. And I decided, because for me, it was, a, in a way, also like a time travel, and I wanted to dress like at the time. So for me, it's a way yes. of imagining, how should I say, like renegotiate that history that happened in the past through yes. um, placing my body into this time and, and, and alter, yes. alter something. And so that's why I felt I want to dress more in a, in a kind of a way of how it was in the, in that time. And I could yes. borrow clothes. Uh, the, the fur coat, uh, for example, was a fake fur, but there were also some comments of people like, how can you be for human rights, but wear a fur coat, <laughs> mm. you know? So there's always this situation that that can happen. But yeah, for me, that was, uh, you know, in the early days, there was no fake fur, you know? <laughs> right. Way, That's right. That's it right. It was not a real fur uh, coat. And so it was kind of, borrowed from artists and other friends so it felt like being um you know not not protected but because this was for me the first time to do this kind of intervention that i t started to call reparative interventions yes the reparative intervention and i believe that that is such a beautiful demonstration of the power of art it is the power of creation it is the power of what it means to build and create something that was not there before for a specific reason. Can you walk us through your process of, okay, I'm out of the studio. I'm no longer confined to create within a building. I can go to the top of a mountain. I can plant my intervention right there in the soil, in the snow. Anyone who walks by and sees this will know what Agassiz has done. They will know that he does not deserve to have all that has been given to him. And they will know that he damaged and harmed people generationally. The ancestors, the descendants of Renty and Delia and the other enslaved people on that property have been trying to get these images back. This is something that reaches as far back into the past as it does into the future. How did you move from then this intervention where you're out in the, in nature and then you come back into the studio and you're like, okay, now it's time to start shooting these staples. How did the, how did those two things work? The outside, the outside space and then shifting to the work that you did with the, with your pneumatic staple gun. Yeah. So, I mean, the stapling started may, way before it was already 2004 where during my studies in Helsinki where I um, was, once again, having expressing my wish to visit Haiti, that then my mother told me not to go because it's too dangerous and, and her, her worry were justified, but still we have family there and, and so on. And, yes. and that frustration kind of brought me to the idea to use this tool that I just had discovered, realizing when t testing it out, out it, be, it is really like a weapon, really. So the sound and mm. you, know, you have to protect your eyes and ears. Really, the weight of that tool really resembled a, a weapon for me very much. So it was immediately clear to me that um, I can use this as a way of dis discussing this unequal power dynamics. So I started to then 
use it as a way to shoot back onto individuals that were a bit responsible of the troubles in Haiti because what it did to yes. me was starting to wanting to know more why is it why is the situation there as it is uh, yes. and still having this very uh, powerful history of being the first black republic the first free nation i believe that haiti is the first is, yes. country to sh to throw off the, the the chains of slavery themselves like mm -hmm. i mean a, a a liberatory model in the caribbean yes so absolutely i just I, i always get excited when people remember that about haiti yeah because mm -hmm. haiti it it mm -hmm. really i feel i honestly believe sasha that the reason that haiti often still struggles today is the resentment of white people the resentment of white supremacy um that haiti had the nerve to free themselves yes i uh, was about to say that as well exactly it's Yeah, it's exactly that and has also inspired so many that came after as well. Yes. And and um, yeah, it's a very important history that is not teached in France, apparently, I've been told. And Cousin Louverture, who was one of the important uh, figures of the revolution, yes. was brought to, to France near the Swiss border, actually, to the castle Fort du Jour. Um, and on the 7th of April, he died. And every year, and actually Hans Fassler is one of the people organizing that, is, there is this uh, pilgrimage organized to go to this place. And then oh. the Haitian ambassador comes there and people who are interested in Haiti and Haitians come yes. there and so on to, to, memor to, to remember mm -hmm. Toussaint Louverture. So that was also yes. interesting that uh, people don't often know about that fact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so you, your yeah. mom, your mom was explaining that you couldn't go to Haiti because she believed it too dangerous. And so you, so is that did that lead you to start making the portraits of the Duvaliers and other folks who had been involved with keeping Haiti in a kind of dangerous situation? Yes, exactly. So that was the, the turning the frustration into something that I felt I could react to. You know, mm -hmm. this, this act of shooting really felt like a way of defending, being able to defend what happened yes. in this, of course, symbolic way. And then I continued this with other figures for a while. And when 2007, this campaign started, I also portrayed Akasis like that. So there exists yes. this portrait of him. But then soon after that, that was in 2008, I felt I don't want to use my energy anymore in portraying people that were firstly written down in history many times were men who did so much harm. And the, re the end result is very uh, in striking, the portrait itself. And of course, the title Shooting Back tells what, what was yes. my intention, but still I create another image of these people. And then I really stopped that completely. And then I started to you know, invest my energy in more telling stories of people that were uh, silenced in the past who who were um, not written down in history and all these um, all these stories. And so the methodology of this shooting back became more of this teaching the colonial wound together. So because the, what you see is really looks stitched, as you say. So yeah. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Hey friends, hey, I know you're enjoying the audio version of Stitch Please and thanks so much for listening. But you're missing out on all the great stuff going on behind the scenes. That's why I'm inviting you to join our Black Women Stitch Patreon. For as little as $5 a month, you can see all the video versions of the podcast. Plus, you get some amazing swatch cards. You know how much I love these swatch cards. Look, look, see how cool these are? I... Oh wait, you you can't you can't see them because you are not yet on the Patreon. So when you join the Patreon, you'll be able to see this me showing you these amazing cards. We also have some great perks at the other tiers, like discounts, swag, office hours, and more. Don't be the last sewist in the group now. Head over to patreon.com slash black women stitch or click the link in the show notes and become a Patreon supporter today. We truly cannot do this without you. So thank you so 
much. Let's turn to um, an image right now. This was what I saw. That was my thinking as well. Um, We're going to shift, y'all. If you're a Patreon supporter, you get to see um, these really beautiful images that Sasha has um, created. And you get to see this one. Can you describe what we're seeing here? How would you put this image in your own words? So maybe I could say that at the time when I did the intervention 2008, I made already a drawing of Renti, who is on the left side here. Uh, it was an ink drawing, and I drew him with a traditional African clothing because yes. he and his daughter Delia beside him, they had no clothes. So the original yes. photographs shows them without clothes. So at that time already I had the feeling of how it must have been um, humiliating to be without clothes in front of strangers standing in front yes. of this wooden box, not knowing what, what's coming out of it. Or, you know, at the time it was like that, you had to hold still. So I kind of put myself in this position and felt I would like to make a drawing where, where he's uh, dressed up. And, and at that time I, it was about Renti because of this renaming of the mountain. And yes. then as part of that, I also made this petition website could, called rentihorn.ch for Switzerland, which is even still online, yes. where people who yes. oh, great. support this idea could put their name, but also leave a message. And it has become an interesting archive of its own because over the years, there are over 3,000 people who, who wrote their, their uh, names there. Yes. Um, and because of this website, I was contacted by the descendant of Renti and Delia, yes. Tamara Lanier, and her and she said her daughters noticed the petition website at the time. So uh, that was very powerful to suddenly have a link to um, yes. Renti and his daughter that would have been impossible for me to create. Um, so she could speak about Renti. She came to Switzerland to one of the openings. Uh, of, a, wow. of an exhibition that took place in the mountains near the mountain as a kind of a compromise because the mountain was never officially renamed. Um, so she mm. was there and could speak about Renti as a human being, like grieving him, yes. his humanity back that was stripped from him and could say that he could read, for example, that he was a spiritual yes. man and give him yes. this dignity back through, through saying that. And that was the most, I think, looking back, that was the most strongest experience for me, you know, to be contacted by Tamara, that this happened, yes. something I couldn't have anticipated. And so I revisited this uh, archive, these photographs that you couldn't really look at many years later. So this was in 2021 when I made this Tailoring Freedom series, which you yes. see here, it's just the first two I made. And, and this was also a gift. It is a gift for Tamara because this is a work oh. of art. You cannot... I cannot sell this work, you know, that doesn't yes, make sense. Yes. Especially yes. after she uh, in 2019 filed a lawsuit against Harvard who's owning those photographs, the Peabody Museum, and in a way those photographs represent her ancestors that are still owned by yes. this institution, this powerful yeah. institution. Exactly. And so this is the ongoing struggle she's in this freedom suit, you call it also, yes. which is the suit, you know, I felt this as a relation, but I called then this series yes. Tailoring Freedom as a way of imagining the freedom to Renti and Delia that they didn't have and uh, in their yes. lifetime, but that Tamara is fighting for. Yeah. And what was important is that the, ma the, the suit that I uh, used as an inspiration for the suit I wore, uh, which is worn by Renti, I saw from uh, photographs of, that were made of Frederick Douglass, Yes. You know, as an idea that he could be free in his lifetime and make um, yes. so much important work and was the exactly. most photographed person at the time, which is really absolutely important to say in that sense. And how he understood the importance of the photography, uh, the, the portrait, and you know, never smiled while he was no. photographed, no. which was very considerate why um, he did that. And, and then... Yeah, the, the dress of the, uh, Delia is inspired by the dress that was worn by Fre um, Harriet Tubman. Yes. Also, same idea that this is a way of kind of imagining the freedom 
that she didn't have. That's, this is how it started. And now the, I continued the series because I felt I, it's important to portray all the uh, seven people similarly. Even the others don't have, the, unfortunately, descendants who fight for their freedom. Um, right. But it was a community also that they all must have known each other. So I felt yes. like it's important that they stay also in this um, that in this group together. And there was one other woman, also a daughter of another person who was photographed. Mm -hmm. uh, her father was Jack and her name was Drana. Uh, yes. Tamara says she, her name was probably Diana. She is dressing a dress that is um, um, inspired by a dress that was worn by Sojunder Trues, which is not yet in the book, actually, because I finalized the series only last year during the summer. Congratulations on finalizing it. That must be a pretty satisfying feeling. Do you ever feel like a work is finished? How do you define that for yourself? Um, I mean, in the broader sense, it's not finished. But in this particular case where I was able to work with the 15 photographs that were made uh, of the yes. seven individuals uh, and getting uh, the possibility to uh, reproduce the photographs, and print them on wood. Um, this is like a, a, yes. a final series, but there were more photographs made in Brazil because he led an expedition in yes. 1865, 66. He yes. produced over 200 photographs of Afro-Brazilian people. And, and I'm also actually after making this first intervention in Switzerland at the time, I'm uh, in 2009 and 10, um, uh, we went to a residency in Brazil because of his connections to Brazil. And so it somehow continued this long, ongoing um, process. Um, yeah, so ever since, and also always in collaboration with um, or in conversation with with Hans Fassler, who who founded this yes. campaign as my kind of historical expert that he is. You know, so collaboration yes. is also important for me. Yes. And I wanted to, as, as we look at these garments, I'm reminded of a question that your work prompted for me, um, just to describe those who are, who are not able to see it, as, as, as Sasha just described. They are wearing these really beautiful, elaborate 19th century clothes that are based on actual garments worn by formerly enslaved people who had had a chance to be free in their lifetimes. Delia, Drana, Renti, all of the other seven people who were photographed by Agassi, their images are still owned by Harvard. And it was such an appalling, in my mind, decision from the judge who said, well, if the enslaved people could not own their images when the images were taken, they do not get to own the images now. And I could not believe that we had a judge in this day and age essentially upholding enslavers' property rights over human rights. And I also struggled to believe that Harvard wouldn't just release the images and say, we were wrong, that's, that's terrible, Let's not let's stop being terrible. What what does it mean for you to to look at your work as a form of justice? Because it seems as though the justice is still on the struggle for justice is still ongoing. How do you think about this in the context of the judge saying, no, Harvard still owns these images, but you have created this artwork that you have given to the family, to the descendants. How does that become a form of, of justice? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, um, that's why Black Lives Matter is so important still now. Uh, and not only in the States, also in Switzerland, many other countries, it's still relevant and the image is like Tamara was saying that she felt I was able to take them out of their circumstances 
that they were mm. in and that they are like in their Sunday's best and and yes that it's like possible to look at them now in a different way yes. and um when I made the work, the decision of the churches was not, didn't happen yet. It was not oh. in response, on it, it was before. Uh, but then when it came out in this way, it was, you know, I also feel it would be so simple if they would just want and understand and take it as a kind of a invitation to do something right, you know, uh, rather than be yes. so um, be so after the book, you know how it usually goes with images. These are not normal images. These are no. This is the thing. These images represent the people that are on it. They yes. couldn't choose to be there. Like they, they had to do it. And I think people don't have a heart. Also, they they like lack the heart. And they forget to put themselves in their position. How would it be for you to see, also to the judge, you know, how would it be for him to see his para, uh, his ancestors naked there? And those photographs would be used for these horrible uh, purposes. How would he feel about it? And I think when people would be more, try to imagine how it must feel, then they would maybe understand more how important it would be to to understand that this kind of uh, act of giving back and, and apologizing would be appreciated, not just by Tamara, it just would be for everybody um, a sign that, okay, we want to do things better. It would be a really powerful gift of compassion and a lesson for all institutions to behave similarly. I think the fear is we know that very many of our museums around the world, especially natural history museums, are filled with stolen things, stolen people, stolen artifacts, mm -hmm. all manner of things. That's why they exist as a whole. The, those that is exactly why they exist. And yeah. so when they're very afraid of decolonizing, I'm certain, because that means they have to return the things they stole. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're like, well, we won't have a museum anymore. It's mm -hmm. like, well, you could put things in there that you didn't steal. How about that? But I wanted to read this quote because it relates really well to your to the tailoring freedom. This is a quote from um, Anna Arabita and Keeson, and she's, it's called Dressing Up and Laying Bare, an article that she wrote. And there were laws that governed what black people could wear during the days of slavery in the United States. And so here's one of the quotes, and it says, under the code, slaves were not allowed to, quote, wear clothes above their condition and no owner shall permit such Negro or other slave to have or wear any sort of apparel whatsoever, finer or, or greater value than Negro cloth. Negro cloth in some ways was like, it was a denim, it was like a, it was a, a very coarse cloth. You have kind of dressed them with the staples. It looks like they're wearing lace, finery, each individual staple becomes a stitch. And one of the things I thought about when I saw this, and this was one of the questions I had for you, it reminds me of the idea of visible mending. Visible mending has become like a very popular form of, of sewing and of repairing one's clothes. So rather than having the mending mm. look very seamless so that it blends into what you're wearing, the visible mending is meant to be seen. Mm -hmm. First thought I had was when I saw these, it was just like, oh my gosh, can visible mending, which is what, what I'm seeing and what you're doing, be a form of repair, a form of reparation? And it looks as if every single stitch, even the way that when you look at the sleeves on Renty's gown, they look like diamonds. Your visible mending here is doing something more than clothing them. It's also, as you said, letting us see them differently. Can you talk about the stitches as visible mending on these photographs? Because it just, to me, it just feels like it's such a reparative, loving 
beautiful condition that you've created. It, it, it seems as though the violation of the photographs are, are, are somehow removed and replaced by care mm -hmm. with you and a staple gun, which could be a weapon, but is now like a tool, almost like a sewing needle and thread. Tell us a little bit about that process and what you see in those in those stitches as a form of visible mending. Yes, thank you. Um, for me, it really is this way of um, creating as well. One could say uh, armor too, because the st the staples are metal, so it is it has a very uh, reflective surface, and uh, depending the um, angle of how they are applied, it looks more three dimensional as well, even if it's completely mm -hmm. flat. Um, so, being metal, it creates also this way, this this uh, possibility of of uh, shielding and protecting. And I also started to call the works to, done in this way uh, pain things. Pain things. Yes, I was going to ask about pain things. So mm -hmm. pain things, y'all, is P-A-I-N dash T-H-I-N-G-S. Pain things. Like it's a play on paintings, kind of. Tell mm -hmm. us about mm -hmm. the pain things. I, 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 I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, because from what happens is, of course, that the each staple is piercing the surface. So it's, it does go under the skin and it is permanent as well. Mm -hmm. There is this pain is there and, and it's, um, but it's at the end, it, it looks soft. Yeah. So it doesn't, you know, kind of, there doesn't happen a re-traumatization like, you know, through this, through this, um, visualization of, of this cloth mm -hmm. that should protect and, and cover up the private, uh, you know, their bodies uh, in this way. And, and my question of creating work with this way was always, um, before I did this particular series, was how can art contribute in healing the colonial wound? And, mm. and this tailoring freedom series is really brings it completely to that point but then also what it ha what happens is because the link to tamara makes it really the personal even more personal you know um i felt already related to these individuals because of my own family history in the you know yes but then meeting someone who who we can talk to now and who has this possibility of seeing the photographs. And that is the, possibly the only positive part of the existence of this photograph because most mm -hmm. um, and, uh, descendants don't have pictures of their descendants, uh, of their ancestors, because they didn't have the privilege of the camera that is used to yes. photograph people that can afford it. Um, yes. and, and somehow creating these clothes makes it like, you know, possible to, to look at the images again. Mm -hmm. look it, at those, and, yeah. and it really does. And I just want to just commend you. Um, I did an episode a few years ago with an artist and she does sculptures and she makes sculptures out of rebar, which is the heavy metal that is inside a lot of construction things here in the U.S. Like, And she takes that thick metal and bends it and weaves it into these sculptures that she also imagines as ancestral remembrances. Mm -hmm. And, um, but she does such wonderful work. And it reminded me of the conflict or the, not conflict, the contradiction between something being hard, rebar, metal, or like in your case, sharp, staples, you know, penetrating the wood and feeling very kind of violent and harsh, but then becoming a conduit for light. Um, and that when you look at it, as you said, like if you look at one side or your angle, it will reflect, it will shine, it will, it will thrive. And I believe that that is such a powerful tribute to the ancestors 
And it is doing exactly what you have hoped. And that is stitching this colonial wound, um, tailoring freedom, dressing people in their dignity um, and allowing our gaze to be focused where it should be, you know, on their beautiful clothes, in the depths of their faces, the looks in their eyes. And I think Christina Sharp in her essay, um, which she calls Shooting Back in the You Name It book, talks about this as, as a form of, of, of suturing, of stitching, of healing. And I think that you've done such a remarkable job with that. And I'm, I'm just so, I'm just so excited to be able to speak with you today about it, because one of the things I've been in, interested in is, I think you mentioned this before, thinking about your family and sewing. It is my contention that sewing itself is a tool that exists beyond the pale of colonial and white supremacist domination. And I come to this theory from Audre Lorde and the way she talks about the master's tools. Um, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And so as I was thinking about, well, what's not a master's tool? Um, and I think the needle and thread are not a master's tool. And you have demonstrated this so beautifully by making the stitches so visible. And when you talk about art as healing, art as revolution, art as, um, as a way of decolonizing, we get to see how that works. We get to see an illustration of how sewing, how textile arts, how making stitches visible become a step on our journey to freedom. Jan, also, I don't ever use this method of working for anything else that relates somehow to it. So that is that makes the tool that is an ordinary tool anyone could use different, I've came to understand. You see, so that is what makes it um, for me important, you know, that I really feel I can address these issues that are so uh, painful in in a, in, a, in this kind of way, and yes. um, and a, a friend, an artist friend, she once said that many of us um, make art that is in a way contributing to this collective effort of of healing through art mm. through this art, and and uh, she said that this fact helps us to bear bear the that that weight. You see, together rather than alone. We are not alone in that. And all things we do is kind of, as in your context really beautifully, this, this the weaving, it's like a weaving together and it creates yes. this fabric that is so beautiful. And it, it always makes me feel like if uh, everybody who is so against us would be open for that beauty, you know what I mean? Yes. It would be just yes. Why? Why yes. is it not? It's so. So that's the reason why I also uh, work about this agassiz. You know, it's something that happened in the past, but the effect it has to our present is so strong still that it's not just, you know, many people say, "Oh, leave it in the past, get over it, and all that shit." Oh, sorry, but really, no, no, that's true. It really makes it's me all, angry. It's best bullshit. That, yeah, it makes me so upset because it's so on the hand that it's still so uh, such a problem and, yes that's right um, but we will not stop we don't we will not stop <laughs> doing something against it and and create create um beautiful images of our ancestors and and of uh, today's people now to stay forever you know Yes, I, I agree. Uh, we're, I want to ask you, um, we're going we're gonna to wrap up our time here. I'm going to ask you the question that I ask all the guests of the Stitch Please podcast. And so the, the, the slogan of the Stitch Please podcast is that we will help you get your stitch together. We will help you get your stitch together. Sasha Huber, artist, revolutionary, um, a, a mountain climber, um, creator of restorative art, um, inventor of pain things. 
how would you invite, how would you help us get our stitch together? What would be your advice to help us get our stitch together? Follow your heart. So simple, whatever it is. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's cliche, but I think that just came, that was like at the top of my heart. <laughs> that That is, makes the world a better place, I think. I, I agree with that. And on that note, Sasha, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so grateful to have you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to stitch with you. Yes, that's right. Thank you. You've been listening to Stitch, Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you joining us this week and every week for stories that center Black women, girls, and femmes in sewing. We invite you to join the Black Women Stitch Patreon community with giving levels beginning at $5 a month. Your contributions help us bring the Stitch Please podcast to you every week. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. And come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together. Stitch, please.